911, what are you reporting? Uh, I got a strange going on out here. Something just killed my dog. Something killed your dog? My dog went flying through the air over the tree. I don't know how it did it. Okay. Damn it, I'm really confused. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence, and he was dead when she hit the ground. I didn't see any cars. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence. What are you reporting? Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? It was. It was standing up. I'm out here looking through the window now and I don't see anything. I don't want to go outside. Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya! Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. All right, folks, I want to welcome our guest to the show. It is Alexander Petikov. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thanks for having me on, Brian. Man, I've been looking forward to this for a while. I'm glad Alex was kind of able to help get us together. So let's get right into it. Let's talk about, well, I want to, for folks who may not know who you are, I don't usually do this with my guests, but your story is interesting. So I really want you to go back to when you were born and talk a little bit about your history and what brought you to the point of being here and where you are today. Yeah, wow. That's uh, not a question I usually get asked, but definitely a complicated one. We'll put it that way. So uh, I was actually born in South Africa. At the time, it was the last year of apartheid. Uh, my parents were from the former Yugoslavia, uh, you know, which was a socialist communist country in Southeast Europe after World War II, and it fell apart in the, in the early 1990s through civil wars, kind of a tough time. So my folks actually fled that conflict and went to South Africa of all places. You know, I, when, when you're picking and choosing, I guess it's, it's tough in that situation. And my dad had some employment opportunities down there. So he went down there and that's actually where I was born. So I kind of like to say that, uh, you know, the little bit of my adventurous side maybe comes from my folks in that, you know, they had left their home country at certain peril and ended up in a place that was completely foreign in every way possible to them. And, uh, you know, they were in South Africa for a few years. I don't have a lot of memories from when I was there. We ended up moving to the United States in the uh, late 1990s. So I really don't have a whole lot of memories from South Africa, but I was told all these stories about my folks, you know, bicycling, with elephants on the border with Zambia and all these other crazy stories, hiking through the Drakensberg Mountains, looking for the Bushman paintings when my mom was pregnant with me. So I like to say, like I said, that, that adventurous spirit kind of comes from that. And uh, I've tried to build an ad adventures of my own kind of based off of the, uh, the family stories. So that's that long story short, that's how I ended up here in the United States. That's one of the reasons I asked the question, because I kind of knew the history and I don't normally start the show by saying, and you were born because that's usually way too far back in history to go. But I thought it was very interesting. And I wondered if you had drawn any parallels to your early life and even before you were born with the adventurous nature of your parents, if that sort of led to some of the decisions that brought you into your current line of work and some of the things that you've sought over your life. Do you think there's a parallel there that, that runs sort of along those lines? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, I was always extremely adventurous as a kid, even uh, just, you know, wanting to kind of uh, explore the world and knowing that sense of wonder. I mean, it's you come from one place or another place, but I kind of had these multiple identities to to draw from. I spent some time as a kid going to what was, you know, the former Yugoslavia, now Serbia, Croatia, a bunch of other countries that emerged from that rubble. So I got to see what a post-war system was like. And uh, very kind of complicated things that were going on there. And I sort of understood that world and uh, the Eastern Europe fascinates me, but Africa just has a sort of adventurous spirit unto itself. And uh, I got a chance to go back there in 2014 for the first time in I think 20 something years. And it was just the moment I got off the plane, I felt that, that air, you know, it's where you're born. I hadn't been there. I have no real connections, any family or anything like that there. So it's just a place that I happened to be born. So um, 
Absolutely. I'd say it inspired some of my kind of adventurous nature. And like I said, those stories growing up, hearing them from my parents uh, and, and the, the nature that's found there in South Africa, I think that really helped play a part as well in my fascination with the natural world. And that eventually led into cryptids and things like Sasquatch and sort of the path that I'm on now and really seeking those adventures that are not only fulfilling to myself, but uh, create a sense of intrigue and mystery with parts of the world that are a little less understood maybe than uh, what we kind of take for granted. Well, let's talk a little bit about how you got started in the, the interest of encrypted. Was it Bigfoot first or was it something else that everybody has that story that kind of got them propelled into this? I know my story is probably unique from yours versus other people's. Was it Bigfoot that started you on this path or was it another cryptid that you were interested in? It was actually the Yeti. So uh, very similar to Bigfoot. And I do have to kind of fault my folks for that one as well. My dad had told me the story of the Yeti and given me this action figure that was a shadow box he used to make these sorts of cryptid figures. And it came with a little scroll that looked like an ancient kind of papyrus scroll. And with the whole story of the Yeti and I was on a ski trip in the mountains and just, it kind of felt, wow, okay, this is interesting. The possibility of these things could be out there. And that started a lifelong fascination, uh, started consuming a lot of uh, documentaries and books on it as a child. And as I was coming up, uh, I was pre-social media when I was in middle school and high school. So that was or right as the, I should say, where social media was taking off. Before that, it was the blog. So that was, you know, when the 2008 Georgia Bigfoot hoax was going on and all that sort of stuff. That was, I remember reading Crypto Mundo and Lauren Coleman, and the blog, and that was really kind of how you found your information. That was even before YouTube. So uh, I guess I was an armchair researcher in a way or just interested. I never really had the chance to kind of go out and look at that time. Um, later on, then I started taking some survival and and naturalism classes dealing with wilderness survival and uh, primitive crafting tools and animal tracking and that sort of stuff. And that really then created a, an interest in the natural world and having some skills to go along with it, not just going hiking or camping, but being able to kind of understand why certain things happen or uh, what kind of trees live in an area, what kind of animals are there, how to follow them, that sort of thing. And I've, I've kind of built off of that knowledge. So from that point on, I guess, it wasn't until actually about 2015 or so that I started getting out in the field. And I, the idea was originally I just wanted to do films. I mean, filmmaking was a big passion of mine, so documentaries. I wanted to do films about cryptids. So I went to Loch Ness in 2015, sort of a post-college kind of uh, trip that I took. In, I was in Europe and decided to go to Loch Ness as a lifelong fascination. I did a short film on that. And then I said, I want to do something on Bigfoot. And I started talking to people in my local area, which is, uh, I, I live in New England, so I'm in New Hampshire. Um, there's not a lot of, people don't, aren't as familiar with stories from this area, but I found that there's actually a lot of them and a long history of them. I started talking to folks and interviewing people, and I really was fascinated. Uh, but my idea was still to just sort of document other people's stories. And then it wasn't until going out with people squatching if we really want to call it that, or you know, doing research, just having fun in the woods at night, that sort of thing, or going out doing glorified camping, basically. And that really kind of solidified my interest and uh, started eventually doing my own sort of research at, at some point. And yeah, one thing led to another. And that's what I sort of really am interested in now. Well, let's talk a little bit about Bigfoot in the Northeast. I know you've had a ton of stories and I'd love for you to share some of those, but I've gotten into not arguments, but disagreements with people like Peter Byrne. I had Peter on the show and Peter doesn't believe that Bigfoot probably ever existed east of the Rockies. And I've documented tons and tons of stories. That's why my, that's why my store, my, my show was born was to document as many cases in the Southeastern United States as I could. I was born and raised in Georgia and I grew up hearing stories from ginseng hunters that were being ran off of mountains by these big hairy wild men that we now know as Bigfoot or Sasquatch, or at least I think that's what they were talking about. And specific, specifically the Northeastern United States, places like New York State and other places have had people on that have found Bigfoot nests and had multiple encounters up there. So people don't normally 
correlate that part of the United States with these kind of encounters. But I know you've got a ton of those stories. Would you mind sharing some of those that that have compelled or had been more compelling to you over the years that you've collected in that area? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, just to address this sort of point about uh, Bigfoot's not being used to the Rockies. I mean, I find that I, I've heard that stated before. I find that really interesting. But two places that sort of broke that mold, I think, before others were Ohio and Florida, of course, with the skunk ape. I mean, uh, John Green famously had, was in correspondence with somebody who was down in Florida claiming we have Sasquatch or Bigfoot-like creatures here. He said, you know, he found that highly unlikely, actually went out and visited there at some point and was kind of blown away by some of the environments found in Florida. And Florida is a very interesting area. I, I, I just got back from there a few weeks ago doing some skunk ape stuff. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's just such a long history, as you mentioned, all up and down the Appalachians, really. I mean, where I'm from, people always get on my case, oh, it's Appalachia. Well, where I'm from, we call them the Appalachians up here in, in the Northeast, because I live in the, the northern sort of terminus. So uh, going from Georgia all the way to Maine, I mean, you've got this rugged mountain chain. Uh, it's not quite as rugged as the Rockies, but I mean, this area was the boundary of the United States at one point, and it's perfect habitat. And if you look at the sightings, you know, say you go on the Bigfoot Mapping Project or other databases and Look at sightings up and down the East Coast. Probably the most are going to be around, in and around the Appalachians, into Ohio, uh, West Virginia, those areas, and then down, obviously, in the Southeast, as you mentioned, and into Florida. But the Northeast specifically, I think even on the East Coast, which kind of gets a bad rep, as you mentioned, for Bigfoot sightings in the eastern part of the U.S., the Northeast really is overlooked, I think. And I think people associate this area as just being all urban and not not very conducive. I mean, very small states, but uh, you have to realize that the states of Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine are extremely sparsely populated. I mean, New Hampshire, yes, it's not a large state, but it's about one one point three million population, uh, and it's it's the second most forested state in the United States after Maine, which is our northern neighbor, which is basically uninhabited for all practical purposes in terms of population, and it's a, it's a large state. Uh, there's more moose in certain counties up there than there are human beings. Uh, and uh, so the idea that there isn't habitat, you look at Quebec, which is just above the Northeast as well, and that's millions and millions of acres of largely uninhabited space. Canadians mostly live uh, with, in urban areas and within a few hours of the U.S. border. So there's just so much space there. And as you mentioned, New York, another story that broke the mold, the Bear Road incident in the 70s with police officers seeing things. That's literally a couple miles from Vermont. I've been to Whitehall many times, and it's a great place, and there's a long history of sightings in that area. And that's just the, the foothills of the of the, the Adirondacks, essentially. And you have, so if you combine this kind of contiguous habitat, you have millions and millions of acres that we know other wildlife use, uh, whether they be large species like moose or black bear, um, tons of white-tailed deer. It's, it's absolutely uh, staggering how much space is actually out here. People don't realize that. I mean, you look at some areas of, say, Oregon or Washington, where entire eastern thirds of those states are an arid desert kind of situation, whereas to the coast in the central areas, that's where you have those rainforests and the Cascades. I mean, you can combine some of those areas looking at New York and parts of the northeast into Canada, and we actually have more space uh, or more forest than those entire areas in the Pacific Northwest, if you were to look at kind of comparatively, which I find interesting. So there's there's a long history of reports. People think because this area was first settled, I mean, it was here along the East Coast. You had, of course, the Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts. Uh, but there are a, there is a history of interesting stories out of this area, sightings. I know in New Hampshire alone, I've gathered about 50 reports in the state of New Hampshire, people that have either told me their stories that I've gathered at events I've spoken at, and I'd be happy to share any of them, but um, BFRO has quite a number of reports in, in New Hampshire. I know other researchers in the state that have a number of reports. And then you look at Vermont and Maine. Maine doesn't have a lot of reports. I mean, there are a good amount, but problem is you need people to have sightings. That's where you get a report. So entire Northern swaths of New Hampshire and Maine that are largely uninhabited, there's a lot less sightings than say a rural area where you still have uh, sparsely kind of populated places where there are rural properties. And I mean, you've got parts of Northern Maine where there's just hundreds of miles of no homes and no human presence. So, you know, what, what's the chances of seeing a Sasquatch in an area like that, as opposed to somewhere where there's a little bit more human habitation, usually the sightings in those kinds of areas, like up in the white mountains in New Hampshire, 
are at the edges of town. So there are these people that regularly interact with moose and black bear and other animals, and they're having encounters, and they live basically on the edge of civilization. That's where these encounters seem to happen, as opposed to you know, a hiker randomly in some large tract of wilderness coming across something. I mean, that's that's definitely rare. It's it's happened, but uh, not nearly as much as towards towns and that sort of thing. Yeah, I agree. I used to think that when I first started looking into the subject years ago, that these things were only out, you know, it was like the Ron Moorhead syndrome. You had to be eight miles out in the mountains, you know, and, and go in on a horseback to find these things. And the more I've interviewed people, you know, I'm almost 300 shows in over here on the Sasquatch Odyssey. And these things live on the periphery. I believe that wholeheartedly. My situation here in North Carolina, we're in a very sparsely populated area of Lenore at the foothills. And there's, I have to drive 10 minutes, but I can get to Walmart in 10 minutes. But when you're on my property, these 40 acres are surrounded by hundreds of other acres of nothing but land. And we've had experiences here that I can't explain. Vocalizations, I believe that we may be even in a gifting situation here where things are being taken from a, a gifting stump that I have on the property. And I would have never thought that four or five years ago. I would have said, you're crazy that these things would even be in an area like where I live. But my eyes have been opened for sure. Would you mind? I know you've taken some of those reports firsthand. Is there any two or three that have really stuck out to you that were really compelling that people have shared with you? Oh yeah. That's always a tough one though. Um, but I, what I will say briefly is uh, this idea that, you know, you have to really go into some deep wilderness areas and, and I've been to plenty of them. And I've been to remote parts of Alaska and other parts of the lower 48 that are extremely remote that I think are great habitat that if these things are out in these areas, I mean, they have it made basically, but uh, you do, as you mentioned, see these reports kind of on the peripheries of towns. And I think that, uh, maybe that's opportunism. Uh, it's just you see other animals utilizing humans and human encroachment for food sources or whatever it may be. So I don't think it's kind of out of the question. But uh, obviously, as I as I said earlier, you need people to have sightings. So it makes sense that that's where sightings would also cluster. But uh, if you look at some of the stuff, for example, with the Bigfoot Mapping Project and, and beltways and animal corridors that exist in different parts of the U.S., especially in the South and other areas where there's maybe more... Uh, densely populated areas, it's pretty interesting how sightings tend to cluster up along those corridors. Uh, very fascinating. But when it comes to New Hampshire specifically, who there's there's a lot of reports that uh, kind of come to mind, but I'll share one that is sort of a, uh, it's a, it's an older story. Um, and I don't have the, I have, I don't have the kind of firsthand account, which I wish I did, but uh, a big mistake on my part. I never took uh, this woman's information down, but I did a library talk Right before COVID started, early 2020, I, I do this Granite State Bigfoot Library talk where I share some history about Bigfoot reports from New Hampshire, that sort of thing. And I always, my favorite part is hearing people afterwards share their stories with me. That's one of the one of the highlights. So there'll be a few people, inevitably I'll get either a new report or some kind of a story. And this woman told me the story of either her, her father or uncle happened to be a prison camp guard in the Second World War. Up in remote northern New Hampshire, there was a place called Stark Camp. You can look it up. It was a prisoner of war camp. So there were German POWs being held there. She told me the story that essentially but the Germans there were put on logging duty. So there's a lot of trees, that area, the great north woods of New Hampshire. Paper mills have been there for a long time. It, there's The logging industry goes decades, I mean, hundreds of years back in that area. Uh, so naturally, they put these POWs on logging duty. And apparently, they were complaining about seeing gorillas in the woods and not wanting to be on duty because of gorillas in the woods, which is a very oddly specific story for that area. I mean, why not make some, if you're going to make up some crazy animal, why not make up, oh, I saw a zebra or I saw a lion, right? If they're just trying to say they're just trying to get off of this duty or whatever, um, you know, being prisoners, but gorillas was oddly specific. And apparently some of the locals equated it to the wood devil story which is a story that goes back into the logging days in the 1800s in New Hampshire, described as these tall, hairy creatures that essentially stand behind trees and are you can almost walk into one before you see it, let out these piercing screams at night. I mean, what does that sound like, right? Um, so the, that story goes back, and I've talked to folks who have had uh, stories growing up, actually, before, well before Bigfoot was known or Sasquatch in that area of hearing 
oh, you know, they're folks saying, don't go too far into the woods or the wood devils will get you. So it's really intriguing. And I've had a couple other people online randomly mention this story uh, saying, oh, I knew somebody start camp. They see they saw wood devils in the woods and that sort of thing. I haven't been able to track down the source, but I'd be really fascinated because those guys, I mean, they were German POWs. They had nothing ostensibly to do with the local culture in that area, wood devils, whatever. Uh, it's just very, very oddly kind of uh, intriguing sort of story. So that's uh, that's one of them that I find pretty intriguing. There are tons of other more contemporary sightings. Um, you know, for example, a friend of mine uh, saw one in an area of central New Hampshire in a state park on Thanksgiving a few years ago and was just sort of driving along the road and, and saw you know, this kind of hairy man-like creature and actually saw its genitals as well, the way that the high beams were on it. Very intriguing encounter. And that's actually a location where we found some, they found some tracks last April. Uh, we actually made some casts out there. We went out there and uh, it seems to be that there, and there are other sightings in that immediate area. So you have this sort of presence of sightings, but one of the most intriguing stories I will say is from the late 70s, 1979. Uh, this is a story I had heard about online at some point. I managed to track down the gentleman and spoke to him a few years ago. But the story goes, 1979, the Ossipee Range of New Hampshire, which is a small kind of volcanic uh, mountain range. Uh, there are smaller peaks, only about three to 4,000 feet. But if you look at it on, say, Google Earth or Topo Map, it's almost a perfect circle. The locals sort of call it the Ossipee Triangle. There's a lot of weird other UFO stuff in that area. Possibly Aleister Crowley went up there to worship on one of the mountains in that area. Really strange, strange stuff. That doesn't ha have anything to do with the story. But this story really intrigued me because uh, people in the Sasquatch subject talk a lot about structures and things that I see a lot of times that I used to build when I did bushcrafting, lean-tos and debris shelters and uh, I, I haven't been convinced by a lot of stuff I've seen online in terms of structures. I mean, I've seen the Olympic Project nest sites out on the Olympic uh, Peninsula. That, that's, you know, in terms of structures, that's something far, far more plausible to me, a nest type thing than some of these stick structures. But back to the sighting, 1979, gentleman was up there with his girlfriend and dog at the time, and they were looking for rocks and minerals. He was a mineral co collector, and they were bushwhacking up on a mountain. I think it was Bald Mountain or something. Yeah, Bald Mountain. And he said they were they come out into this clearing in the woods and they've been bushwhacking for a while. And they see this stone structure of stacked rocks with hemlock on the sort of as a roof. And inside was this large hairy creature sitting there, apparently with its back towards them. He said he was very confused. Uh, the dog, once it noticed this creature started growling then this creature let out some sort of a noise, guttural kind of sound. It freaked them out. They essentially just booked it right out of there and ran down the mountain halfway down, realized they had a camera, but nobody had the bravery to actually get back up there, uh, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, you know, you hear that a lot. I'm sure you've heard it plenty of times, you know, uh, which I wish, you know, they had, somebody had the fortitude to go back up there and snap a picture, but, um, he never, when I talked to him, he never described it as a Sasquatch. I mean, that's what he was kind of equated it to, but thought it was really weird. And there was almost like knots on the hair, kind of dangling, that sort of thing. But I mean, it was very large. He never saw a face or anything. The noise, he said, was sort of indescribable, but it was very frightening. I, again, it sent them halfway down the mountain uh, and it took him a year to get back up there. Uh, and he went back up to the same spot nothing. There was not even any indication that anything was there. Uh, and apparently after the incident, his girlfriend went to the local library and uh, was doing some research on that area, an area called Connor Pond. And I haven't been able to verify this story. Um, he told me, you know, this is what she did, but she found a book that detailed an encounter from the 1890s in which a dog got stuck in this, in the ice in that pond and there was a man who lived in a cabin there, and he witnessed this tall, hairy man come out of the woods and take the dog out of the ice and rescue it, and then went back into the woods. Weird, you know, that's the same area. Uh, you know, one of those things, what do you do with that sort of thing? But like I said, he never, he never said it was Sasquatch. He said it was really a strange creature of some kind, but he said there wasn't a day that went by that he didn't think about this thing. And... Um, Again, that structure doesn't fit with anything I've ever heard in terms of Sasquatch or anything like that. So was that Sasquatch? I don't know. I mean, 
maybe behaviorally it fits the bill in some aspects with the noise that was heard. But uh, that one's one of the more kind of weird or, or interesting ones because it, it involves a supposed structure. I mean, there, there's a lot of other ones. You know, a lot of them are the typical sightings of, oh, it was crossing the road or, uh, you know, it slapped the side of the house, threw a rock at the screen in front of my face, that sort of thing. Um, but that one, I think, sticks out to me just because of the nature of this structure. And, you know, I, sp I spoke to him on the phone a few years ago. He didn't want to do an interview, a sit down interview or anything like that. He just said, you know, I'll tell you my story and, you know, do with it what with it what you will. So that one's interesting. I'm glad you mentioned the structures because that's something it was on my list to check off to to cover with you, because it's something that sticks out to me over and over and over in a lot of the interviews that I do. And of course, a lot of the stuff that you see online. And again, here, some of the experiences I've had on my own property. Now I'm a healthy skeptic, right? Five days out of seven, I believe these things exist in some capacity. I'm just not completely over the hump yet because I haven't had my own sighting. I haven't right. had enough of an experience to say 100%. Yes, that's a Sasquatch. But some of the things that are happening here on the property around the gifting stump, after I've had a couple of jars of sun butter disappear out of this stump, I've found a tree that's wedged behind another tree and behind another tree that I can't, I mean, I, I could physically move it with a sledgehammer if I really tried and other things that are woven into each other. And I've, I've posted them online. Everybody can see them on Instagram and, and TikTok and other places, but it's interesting to me because I don't know what would really do that. Right? right. I mean, there's plenty of deadfall. You know, I don't, I'm not one of these people that hike around and see an X, you know, two sticks right. crossing or making an X and going, Oh my God, that's Bigfoot. No, that's probably just nature. But I've had people compare some things to me. You know, when you do find some really intricately woven together structures, like I found here, sure. If you took those sticks, say it's 10, 15 sticks and you throw them up in the air, how many times would you statistically have to throw them up so they land in that exact? formation. You know, it's just something to think about, but until I'm one of those people, I'm a one-to-one -one correlation kind of guy. I was a cop for 16 years. So my brain automatically goes to, I need to know that someone saw a Sasquatch making that before I can really, and then there's probably footprints after that, right? So you have that other layer of, okay, this thing was here. It put that together. This person saw it. And then they collected the tracks and documented that. And as far as I know, I don't think that's ever been done, right? But the structures are interesting to me and tree breaks and other things that, you know, I've talked to Doug Highcheck. You and I were talking about Doug before we went on. Doug has talked about the tree breaks and how they point towards water. And he has all these theories about them. Mm. And I think that's great. I love theories, but I'm just not sold that the structures make sense to me. You know, the tree breaks don't make sense to me. And, and normally in nature, Animals don't do things that don't make sense, right? right? There's got to be, if if we're out surviving and you're looking for food and you're trying to procreate and find water and all these things, it doesn't make sense. Why are you going along snapping trees or building structures that are way too small for if these things are what everybody says they are and they're gigantic, they're not going to fit in these things. So what's the purpose? So that's where my mind goes as far. I know I'm off on a tangent, but that's no. just where I go with the structures, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I should what I should say, clarify my statement. <clears throat> when it comes to structures, I think a lot of what I see online, and that's what I touched on earlier, are, are people basically posting old debris shelters and very obviously in, in urban parks where you know there's people practicing bushcraft. I mean, I even had a situation in a state forest in Massachusetts where somebody was claiming they were finding these giant teepee structures that they could go in. Immediately, I knew they were human. I could literally go and sign up for a class to do bushcrafting in that very forest. But this person insisted, no, it was absolutely not uh, people, which, you know, how do you argue with that sort of thing? But I have, I have been out and found, as you mentioned, sticks and things that don't make sense. I mean, most of the time, especially in an area like where I live, I mean, we've got some snow outside right now, snow load and winter out here absolutely can create some crazy sort of things. But in my earlier days getting out in the field, with a uh, researcher up in northern New Hampshire who's of Native American sort of uh, heritage and looks at it from that perspective, uh, we had gone to an area where there was some potential activity where I heard some of my first sort of knocks and whoops and that sort of thing, had vocals. And, you know, we would find one week there wouldn't be anything there. The other week there'd be a, just a, a like a, a Y of a tree jammed with all this debris 
that I would say, okay, I mean, something like that could happen from a river, but what's that doing at the top of a ridge next to another one? And then seeing this sort of asterisk looking thing. I mean, can I say what did that? Absolutely not. Could have been a person for sure. Could have been totally random. But there are some that are more convincing than others that don't make a lot of sense. I think, unfortunately, the majority of it online is what people kind of point to is not that great. But as I was talking about with you know, the, the specific example of the Olympic Project nests, I mean, uh, not sure if they're Sasquatch, but I mean, I found what was so compelling about going to that location was how tough it was to get down there. I mean, you're battling huckleberries that are as tall as you uh, and uh, these bushes that are smashing you in the face all every, every moment, really tough to get in there. I mean, it's some serious bushwhacking out there. And where are these 23 to 26 nests and Shane Corson or anyone, if you guys can correct me on that, I think it's somewhere in the 20s in terms of individual nests they found and they were strategically placed. And there was one that was sort of at the edge of this ravine and that's where they found these rocks that were smashed together that almost looked like they had score marks on them. I've seen them. They collected those rocks and they've cast handprints in the prob- the partial construction of one of these nests in an encounter they had out there. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've probably talked to those guys and heard, heard some of that from them directly. But uh, from my perspective, seeing that location, what would drive something to or somebody to create these nests? And they weren't easy to make. Shane demonstrated to us breaking off some of these huckleberry branches, which look deceptively easy to break. I mean, we're talking maybe, you know, a few inches in diameter, but I mean, even an adult male human trying to break it very tough. And these things were snapped and woven in a strange kind of pattern. And I've heard the theory, oh, it's eagles, eagles nests or bears or muskrats. I mean, I've heard a lot of that. It doesn't really fit. And the person who had initially found those nests was somebody who had spent decades in the Pacific Northwest and never, ever once seen anything like that. So something like that, I mean, is that really a structure as, as in the kind of conversation we're talking about? A little bit different, but obviously when you bring in primatologists and folks that see parallels with other parts of the world with known primates, that's where things sort of get interesting. And, and we've heard of talk of other nests in other parts of the U.S. I've never heard of any nests found in this part of the country. Uh, the, like I said, the only structure story I have is that one with that sort of stone structure, which just sounds so out of the ordinary for anything Sasquatch like. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of theories about what it could be. I don't know. I think unfortunately for me, especially, uh, I'm, I'm more of a, you know, I ha- like, as you said, I've never seen kind of a Sasquatch doing this. I want to know report somebody's seen one bending trees. I and mean, we know bears climb into saplings and, and when they weigh it down, it'll look almost like a pressure twist. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot more that needs to be looked into on there, but unfortunately people get really caught up and I think easily get the Bigfoot on the brain sort of thing. And that's not to discount nests. As I mentioned, I think there's, there's definitely exceptions to that that are, that are impressive and hard to explain. But uh, in my experience, that's sort of what I've, the conclusion I've come to at this point. I definitely agree. And I, I'll be honest, the first time I had a conversation with Shane Corson about those nests, I was about 40% on the side of those may be something. And the more I talked to Shane, and like you said, he described the area. He sent me photos of and videos of them walking into the area. And I was Oof. like, holy shit. Like, who's going to go down there bad, and do yeah. these? And then yesterday, I, I, we were talking beforehand. I, I got I was on with Cliff yesterday, Cliff Brackman. And Cliff was talking about more the second nest site and some of the really intriguing things they found as far as footprints and even hand and it may be what you were referring to where Cliff was describing where these things are literally sticking their hand with fingers underneath these, this stump and whatnot and pulling the material that's already there and using it to create these nests. And I don't know any animal on earth that doesn't have thumbs and fingers that's going to be doing that. And it's certainly not going to be a person. If you've seen, like you said, Alex, where the area is, there's not a person up there doing that. So there may be a there there. I don't know. It's, it's interesting to say the least for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And just, I mean, I've seen the hand cast from that incident, which Shane and Todd Hale were out there. This was, I think, right around when COVID started. And they actually thought they were being circled by a bear as they and they drew their weapons at one point because something had charged out and was sort of walking around. And that's when they found what looked like a partially constructed nest. But I, like I said too earlier, just how difficult it was to get down in there really was a pain in the behind. Um I don't know. It, it really kind of sparked my imagination. I wonder 
play, is that a specific thing, maybe say in the Olympic Peninsula, which is some of the highest concentration of sightings and probably some of the best habitat out there, especially in the Pacific Northwest, which already has so many great reports and habitat. And you look at, is there similar things in Vancouver Island, which is just right across, you know, a channel in the ocean from uh, the Olympic Peninsula, but no, is anybody really even looking for that sort of thing? I mean, the chances that this happened was extremely random. So, um, but uh, I think those guys do great work and uh, I'm always interested to hear. And, and Chris Spencer, who I talk to a lot, he's, he's kind of my go-to audio guy, him and David Ellis, as, as I'm sure for a lot of folks they are, but Chris um, has been doing a lot of audio studying of that specific nest site, basically recording year round and noticing patterns and very few times they'll get anything that they can even put in the category of possibly interesting, possible suspect species, which might be Sasquatch. So uh, that kind of data gathering, I think, is impressive. And um, yeah, those guys definitely do a great job. I certainly agree. I want to talk about, let's fast forward a little bit and talk about small town monsters. Let's talk about Beyond the Trail, specifically Bigfoot Beyond the Trail. What are you guys, I had uh, Seth on the show months ago, uh, towards the end of last year, and Seth even shared some of his personal experiences towards the end of the year that he had had while you guys were out filming. And I know you get you get out into the field and you do this, you're looking for these things. Have you had personal experiences? I know you've referred to a couple of them, but what other personal experiences have you had when you've been out there on the trail of Bigfoot? Yeah, I mean, uh, specifically with Bigfoot being on the trail, I mean, we really try to get into some areas that are either I don't want to say hot spots, but known for history of sightings, or we'll go into somebody's property that maybe has, they've invited us on, they have a history of stuff. So um, like in the Alaskan coastal Sasquatch chronicling an interesting area of coastal Alaska, the Kenai Peninsula, where we were essentially invited on uh, by the property owner and um, spent almost nine days out there in an area that's over an hour boat ride from the nearest town. I mean, as remote as you can get up in Alaska and a uh, lot of interesting kind of stuff there. Nothing I can say definitively Sasquatch-like, but I mean, you're just sitting around the campfire and all of a sudden you hear a clear wood knock from the hill behind you and you start hearing what literally sounds like rocks being thrown into the ocean, but hitting other stuff on the way down. So hitting a tree and then hitting another rock on the beach before splashing into the water. Um, we heard some mystery gunshots out there. So uh, this would happen every once in a while. And this is chronicled in the episodes both part one and two, where uh, one of the gentlemen at the cabin there had heard a gunshot and we happened to be across the bay in a, in a Zodiac or a kind of dinghy exploring an area. And he thought, oh, they had shot a gun. You know, Alaska, we we're all armed because we've got brown bears and giant moose and <laughs> it's a very dangerous place. Um, and essentially this, this gunshot noise had been heard when we were exiting the woods and they had come to our rescue thinking we had shot a gun essentially. Uh, and then I actually heard one of these while coming out of the cabin one afternoon. And just all of a sudden it sounds like there's a gunshot. And I mean, how remote of an area we are, there really should be nobody out there. We would know. Uh, and it just sounds like a gunshot in the distance, whether it was uh, some kind of a power knock or something, I don't know. But uh, Alaska was, a, was an interesting one, but we have been to, I mean, more locations than I can list off the top of my head now. Uh, across you know, the Indo Pacific Northwest, down south, uh, up and down the Appalachians. Uh, haven't really broken in the Midwest a little bit, but hoping to get out there soon. But um, you know, a lot of it is just sort of stuff that I can put in a category of weird. I can't say definitively any of it's Sasquatch. I've never had a sighting of my own. So I'm kind of like in, in your camp. I think we can see eye to eye on that. Of you know, it's It's so compelling. You hear the stories, you hear all this stuff, you see possible evidence, but you still can't hundred percent say because I haven't seen one of these things, but um, just a lot of the encounters have been hearing very clear wood knocks, that sort of thing, uh, seven or eight different objects thrown towards us at one point in the green mountains of Vermont. Um, just things that are interesting that you can put in a category that says, okay, based off of other experiences and other anecdotal evidence, does this possibly fit into the behavior of something like a Sasquatch? So that's that kind of category I put it in where, I'm not hanging my hat on it saying 100% Sasquatch, but I say, okay, weird. Um, you know, hearing a pretty clear whoop actually in, in Laos camp, which is in Bluff Creek. When we were out there um, in the summer of 2021 uh, with the Bluff Creek project and all those guys and a really weird incident we had in which my buddy Ron Reed, who is a hardcore backpacker, 
a great guy has been doing some great Sasquatch stuff for a while. His dog bandit uh, started freaking out. We were actually going to the site of where the original Bigfoot footprints were found in the late 1950s, where Jerry crew discovered those famous tracks that gave way to the name Bigfoot. Uh, and it was one of our last nights there. We spent about a week in, in Bluff Creek, very remote area. And we're being shown this site by Jamie Wayne of the Bluff Creek project. And he's kind of explained the whole story. You know, this is where the footprints were found. That's where the 50 gallon oil drums are thrown into the Creek, the whole kind of mythos behind it. And my buddy Ron's dog started acting really weird and ducking into the bushes. And, um, this dog has hiked the entire Appalachian trail. I mean, probably has been out more than vast majority of humans. He's been around other wildlife and started acting strange. A couple of the guys in the back part of the group started saying they were hearing faint knocking noises, stuff in the woods moving, something kind of weird. And there was a bunch of us, and we were all kind of just observing this area, you know, where these prints were found. A bandit kept trying to duck into the woods. Ron says he usually does that when he's really scared, maybe fireworks or, or thunder or something like that. Uh, that's his kind of go-to is ducking in a bush on the side of the trail. Uh, his, his tail was solidly between his legs. I've never personally seen a dog that, <laughs> that kind of disturbed. Uh, this dog never has to be leashed. Well, we had to make a makeshift leash out of our friend's belt just to contain Bandit to get him back to camp. <laughs> so we get him back to camp. We're all hanging out in Laos camp. There's maybe 15 or so people hanging out by the fire. Ron's camp was towards the edge of uh, where Laos camp is. So bandit then he's wagging his tail he's happy to be back and i i happen to be filming and i walk over to him to just pet him and say hey what's up bandit and i hear this clear whoop immediately turn the camera and i said is that ken ken, ken gearhart who happened to be in camp there uh, was hanging out uh, there's just a ton of people the bluff creek project every year they do this sort of get together in house camp so i'm thinking maybe it's rowdy kelly or one of these other guys that they'll do whoops every once in a while i'm asking everyone no one else heard it I mean, there's like two people standing 10 feet from me conversing to each other, did not hear it at all. I heard it. The camera picked it up really clearly. I mean, you can hear it right after I'm talking. And then I sort of say, hey, is that Ken? Trying to figure it out. I talked to everyone in camp. Most people were too busy cooking hot dogs and yapping away to hear anything. And in the area they were in, which is the center of camp, is right near where Notice and Bluff Creek are. And so there's the water. So you really can't hear anything when you're that far in. I happened to be far enough to the edge of camp. I think that I was able to hear something in the area. And, and then I'm asking Rowdy Kelly, you know, was it possibly your dog? He says, nope, doesn't sound like my dog. I had the only other dog in camp next to me. It wasn't him. Uh, you know, I had Chris Spencer check out that audio and he thought it was very suspect, very intriguing and, and you know, hurts levels and just thought it was sort of a potentially interesting. I mean, I don't know, but that area has a history of that sort of thing in Laos camp. Uh, James Bobo Fay had a class A sighting there right in Laos camp. There's been a history of people swimming in the creek and, and on the hills above seeing Sasquatches looking down at them. Uh, my buddy Jonathan Easley of Western Bigfoot Exploration a few years before we were there was in Laos camp with a couple other people and, and essentially was making this video and, and doing outtakes, trying to film himself talking and he kept screwing it up and he gets home a few days later thinking, okay, I'm just going to delete this. And he's listening to it. And during that clip, he captures this absolutely bizarre sound of almost sounds like a man rah, rah, doing this strange scream. And there was only a few other people in camp. All of them were accounted for. That wasn't any of them. He didn't hear that in person. The camera picked it up. Maybe the sound of the creek sort of masked that sound. So uh, that area in Laos camp has a long history, but that was a weird one that happened to me. That was very clear. I mean, it was just intriguing and given the circumstances with the event previously with bandit and some of the things that happened i mean i could go on there's just a lot of a lot of places and i don't i'm not one of these people that goes out in the woods and every time we experience a sasquatch i mean absolutely i think very rarely does that happen most of the time you go out there nothing's gonna happen or you'll hear something that maybe you think is interesting but through a pr process of elimination you can say okay i mean what are the facts let's eliminate all the other things before we jump to the conclusion of sasquatch which i think any researcher should be doing. But uh, there's been a handful of times, a, a, as I've mentioned with some of those, where we've had things happen that sort of, you can't say definitively, but you put in that category of interest in. I've always wanted to go out to Bluff Creek, and I'm hoping that I may get out there this summer with Tate Hieronymus. I don't know. That may or may uh, not happen. <laughs> Tate is, yeah, he's, 
I just got back from Florida with him. He's a, he's a good friend and one of the Bigfoot Beyond the Trail crew guys for sure. And he knows Bluff Creek very well. That's kind of his stomping ground. So I think you'd be in good hands if you were to go out there with Tate. You mentioned it a couple of times, and I feel compelled to tell everybody a little bit about the Bigfoot Mapping Project. Can you kind of tell everybody, give them an overview of what that is and how they can access that and get, get a hold of those reports? Yeah, the Bigfoot Mapping Project is done by a guy named Scott Tompkins, a friend of mine. Uh, he started this a few years ago, and the idea is basically you've got all these different databases. Uh, obviously, the BFR are probably the most well-known, the largest public database. You've got uh, the NAWAC, formerly Texas Bigfoot. They have a pretty good uh, collection of reports in the southeast. You've got Oregon Bigfoot, Bigfoot Encounters, all these different sites that have aggregated and congregated different sighting reports from across the world, really decades ago or fairly recently. I mean, there's so many GCBRO. I mean, I can just think of a ton off the top of my head. So Scott had the idea to kind of bring that all together and use a map. And he does uh, GIS work. Um, that's what he does professionally. So he's very skilled with it and using that data, basically plotting sightings on a map saying, okay, we have all this raw data. I mean, in my view, and I agree with Cliff Berrickman on this, uh, you know, quite a bit in terms of sightings, you know, an individual sighting largely isn't that useful. I mean, you get a sighting from 20 years ago. Sure, the story's interesting. I'm not trying to negate or downplay that. But uh, I know guys up here in New England that, you know, they waited until they retired to w go public with their story because they didn't want to be the guy on the logging crew who's the Bigfoot guy or they somebody was relentlessly made fun of. So they kept it quiet. But you get a fresh report. You know, maybe you can head out to that location, find secondary evidence, whether it be footprints, hair, whatever it may be. Uh, that's where a sighting is made more useful. But when you put them all together, you can start looking at patterns, start noticing things in terms of, okay, as I mentioned earlier with those animal corridors, well, why are, you know, if Sasquatches are kind of all figment of our imagination, why are the sightings perfectly lining up to these animal corridors, which we know other species use? It's just kind of, it's sort of intriguing. I mean, and then you can start saying, okay, what types of behaviors are, are, are reported in Colorado, maybe in the summer months versus the winter months, higher elevation, the elk move up and down the elevation, the sightings, do they follow that pattern? You can take that data and obviously not all eyewitness sightings are credible. I mean, some people are mistaken. They're not all black bears as, uh, as has been the headlines lately, which I think is, uh, you know, why not look at areas that don't have black bears that have Bigfoot sightings? They, they didn't think of that. Um, but, uh, so what Scott did with the Bigfoot mapping project, I think is great. Uh, we use it quite a bit in the field in times where we do have connections, but he'll do some custom maps for us every once in a while. Uh, for example, last January when we were in uh, the big Cypress preserve in Florida, I, I actually am really into mountain lions and mystery big cats as well. So be, having the Florida Panther down there, I had to make a custom map of skunk ape sightings aggregated as well as t telemetry data from collared Panthers that, the Florida Wildlife Commission down there uh, observes and just being able to use that and say, OK, well, there's been activity in this area. Should we try here? I mean, I'm also of the opinion that if Sasquatches have been seen in an area, if that area is still conducive, I don't see why you couldn't expect to possibly uh, have an or not an encounter, but they might be in the area. You, you might be able to draw that sort of assessment. But what the Bigfoot Mapping Project is doing that I don't think has been really been done before is combining a lot of those data sets from the BFRO and others and putting them in one place. And if you if you want to report a sighting, I mean, he's gotten a lot of sightings in the last couple of years that aren't on the BFRO or aren't on an, any other site that people have independently found him and report their sightings. And you can go on to bigfootmap.com and put your sighting in there. Even if it's an older sighting, just help us out. Just throw that data on there. Why not? Um, and an interesting point, what essentially is being done is you're using crowdsourced data to try and help locate wildlife. So going back to the Florida panther example, uh, the Florida Wildlife Commission tracks panthers. And, and for folks that aren't aware, Florida panthers are, uh, they're not technically a subspecies. They're basically a, a group of mountain lions that adapted to living in the southeastern U.S. And now their range is limited to basically almost a little under 3 million acres of protected land in southern Florida. And there's a few hundred of them left. And when people see these, you can actually go to the Florida Wildlife Commission website, Panther Tracker, report your sighting, put evidence in there. If you've got a photo or a track, they will then look at that and put it on their map if they deem it credible. You know, if, if they think it's a bobcat or it's definitely not a panther, they can then, you know, not include that. But they're, they're vetting those sightings. So that's 
uh, I think a very similar kind of concept. I mean, I personally have put Panther tracks that I found down there onto that website, onto the Florida, Pan uh, Florida Wildlife Commission Panther tracker and have, have that gone public. So they're essentially using crowdsourced data to help in the study of these creatures. They're saying, okay, there's a lot more Panther sightings now in, in suburban Naples, Florida. You know, which is an area where you've got retirees living and there's panthers in people's yards. They're getting them on trail cameras and seeing them. Obviously a panther is probably a much different animal than a Sasquatch. I mean, uh, it, it is, but they're still an intelligent, uh, large feline. So they are smart animals, but uh, they're being seen in these areas and using that data, I think is an interesting model with Sasquatch because, you know, while some of the data may be faulty, we still can maybe, you know, get some of those really great reports and say, all right, well, here's what we have. And, I think that's what the Bigfoot Mapping Project has done pretty well. So, um, yeah, I definitely recommend people go check it out. Uh, Scott's a great guy. We're actually about to get in the field together down in uh, Louisiana soon. So I'm really excited to get out there. And he's a hunter, so he kind of comes from that perspective. And he's had an encounter in East Texas. So I think he does a great job and uh, very uh, willing to work with you if you are interested in certain types of data. He can you know, kind of point you in the right direction. Yeah, I would definitely love to have him on the show. He's been on my list for a while. I want to talk a little bit about evidence. And this came up with Cliff last night when I was talking to him. And I knew where this was going to go with Cliff. But I'll ask you, how, because it's happened to me. I, I started the show and I started taking just the first documentation I ever did on the show of a sighting. It was here in North Carolina. It was a roadside crossing. It was very brief. The guy came on and shared his story. But the more that I've talked to people, I've had not a ton, maybe 25% or so, maybe less of the reports that I get that are possible Sasquatch encounters or experiences come with something else. This woo factor, right? It takes a detour into the paranormal. How do you deal with that? Or as a researcher that's looking into this and you seem very scientific, you, you, you take a very logical approach to this. And yet I get these people who tell me these really fantastical things, right? I, I was editing some material before I got on with you and this guy had a really intense encounter when he was hunting deer in a deer stand. And then it goes into a little bit of a different scenario that was a little bit more out there. And then he ends up seeing an orb that turns into a possum <laughs> during an encounter. So how do you deal with that? How do you compartmentalize that? Do you think there is a, some sort of a connection possibly with these things? If these, if any of this exists at all, or how as a researcher and somebody looking into this from a scientific standpoint, how do you deal with those kind of encounters that go into the woo? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it comes up a lot nowadays. I think people have a big interest in that. And I mean, simply put, I don't know. I, I, I don't know about any of it. I mean, we're working on so many hypotheticals here and mostly working with anecdotal data. So it's, it's difficult as it is. Uh, in my experience, personally, a vast majority of the reports I've personally taken or heard of or interviewed folks, I mean, just from previously my experience here in New Hampshire and, and now going to Bigfoot Beyond the Trail, I mean, we're interviewing people across the U.S. A vast, vast majority of those, probably I mean, at least 85 to 90 percent are nothing unusual. I mean, this thing is acting in a way that seems to be just interacting with its environment. You know, the typical kind of stereotypical road crossing sighting or oh, across the trail in front of me, or, you know, I saw it run through the power line cut, that sort of thing. There isn't anything weirder. I mean, unless you know, obviously seeing an eight foot tall, hairy creature in the woods, man, like it's probably weird enough. Right. But um, there are a minority reports I have, uh, received and talked to folks that, in, in my view, they seem credible. They truly believe what they've seen with the orb stuff, with the weirder stuff. I mean, the telepathy and the mind speak kind of stuff, I, I tend to, I'd be a little more skeptical of that. I've never experienced anything really unusual. I've seen UFOs and that sort of thing. I do think there are other weird things going on. I mean, we sit here in a time where, you know, governments are claiming to be shooting them down and <laughs> <laughs> everything that that goes with we won't get into that but i do think there are other things in the woods other than sasquatch there are weirder things other things that we just don't understand i mean whatever orbs are, are they connected i really don't know i mean i've never experienced it personally aside from the ufo stuff uh you know my buddy tate Hieronymus, uh we were down in florida with stacy brown and and some of those guys and uh, they were with a, a you know we were in one group and tate was in another group with rpg and some other folks and 
they heard these wood knocks that night and it was really interesting. And then this guy, James Brost and Tate at one point, both saw in together what was like a blue light move through the trees. And they both were extremely weirded out by it. And Tate is you know, very, very much on the flesh and blood side. Uh, didn't know how to explain it. Interesting. You know, I don't know. <laughs> don't know what to make of that. I mean, you hear wood knocks and you get orbs in the same night. Is it connected? Possibly, but possibly not. Uh, I really don't know. I, I'm not. The thing is, I'm not going to cherry pick the data that suits me. If I do get a report or something that somebody has these weird details, I absolutely will include it. Um, I mean, in my first ever Bigfoot Beyond the Trail, in which I was looking at a personal case here in New Hampshire, in which I was an area where I had done some some uh, camping and that sort of thing, and I'd experienced some wood knocking and other activity, and was later linked up to a guy who, who owned the closest property to that tract of woods I was in had been experiencing stuff for years, uh, mostly knocks and that sort of thing and, and stuff getting thrown at the house. And he had one experience where he saw this glowing sort of orb in the, in the, um, in his yard and was kind of watching it for a bit. It dissipated and then got a rock thrown at the screen in front of his face, basically. And it was after that point that he contacted the BFRO because he was kind of afraid of, you know, all these other things happened and what he got to a point where he sort of thought, okay, maybe is it Sasquatch after doing some research, you know, isolated incidents that once added up, maybe fit the bill. But I included that in my first big foot beyond the trail. I mean, I don't know what to make of that, right? Is it connected? Maybe. Uh, I really don't think we know yet. And I think a lot of people are extremely on either side or very opinionated. I do tend to think though, I've noticed a trend with people on more of the woo and the paranormal side is that they take on a little bit more of a messianic kind of complex of, oh, you know, you guys don't know what you're talking about. You'll get to this point at some point, you know, it's a, and not to say that there are our flesh and blooders absolutely like that too. Don't get me wrong. I don't know where I fit. I mean, I, I, I think to me, logically it makes sense that there is some sort of a species of uh, relic hominid or hominin man beast anthropoid whatever you want to call it that that exists in these environments uh, having been to some of the more remote locations of north america i mean people have no idea how much space is still out there and especially now we're moving more towards urban and suburban living of especially places like canada parts of the u.s uh, there's less and less people really in remote areas and think about it we we stick to the trails we stick to the known areas you know and that's why the idea with us was beyond the trail kind of get beyond that, get into some of these areas and, and see. But uh, people really underestimate, I think, how much space is still out there and the ability for something to stay hidden, I think, is still there. Despite all odds, um, I think it's still possible. You know, we, I don't know, we, we have technology that's advancing. I think eventually we'll catch up to it. But uh, regardless of it's flesh and blood or, or something more, there is still a physical aspect to it. I mean, people are still reporting tracks. People are still seeing something that's interacting with its environment, throwing objects, whatever. So I think it's irregardless of what it is there. You can still track it. You can still find evidence of it, even if it isn't, you know, what, what some of us think it is, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a cop out, I guess my answer, because I just, I simply say, I don't know. I mean, that's the thing with most of the subject is we really don't know until we have other ways to sort of sub substantiate it. But uh, I think in the past, people, especially now, I think focus on either in the past, it was flesh and blood. And if there were any other weird aspects, they were either totally disregarded or just downplayed. And now I think there's some people on the other side, too, that are, you know, they just they want those weirder reports. And, and, and a more sensational report is going to generate more interest, right? If you have somebody seeing a Sasquatch and orbs flying out of it, that's a little more interesting, I guess, in terms of what people will talk about than a oh, road crossing or something that's happened a thousand times over. Uh, not to say those are insignificant because they're a part of that data set, but they're not going to generate the buzz as something more spectacular. And I think people, unfortunately, in a lot of cases are poor eyewitnesses and in a moment of high intensity where for anybody to see one of these things probably would, especially if they're not familiar with it as we are, they probably would be trying to figure things out, you know, adrenaline, maybe certain things play into details. I don't know. Again, I'm not trying to negate or downplay anyone's experiences, but we simply don't know. But in my experience, long, long answer made short is that uh, most of the reports I've taken are nothing really that out of the ordinary. That's exactly what Cliff said to me. He said probably less than 10%. So he basically just tosses them out with the bathwater because there's not enough of them to really affect the overall data right 
cumulatively when people are having thousands of encounters across the United States. I want to talk a little bit about the evidence and something that's really been sticking in my craw for it's kind of been my theme for this year is, you know, we we've been basically on the five yard line since the Patterson Gimlin film in 67. Right. And there's not a whole lot that's happened to move the ball down the field at all. And I did an entire show. I just literally posted it this morning. I did a live show a couple of weeks back and I had a guest on talking about drones and using drones and why they're not being used in Bigfoot research. And we get into the nuances of the Bigfoot community and the boots on the ground researchers that get butt hurt because they want that personal experience to say, I saw it and I conquered it and I'm the one that got the hair or whatever. And then there's just the, the cost factor. I, I talked a little bit about this with Cliff. There's a cost factor that's involved in advanced thermal drones are not cheap, no but way. I'll ask you, you go out in the field, it's maybe a two-part question. First part of that would be, it, it, you're kind of on the fence, you and I are about 50-50 with the subject, I think we can agree on that. Has there been any evidence that you've seen, maybe the Patterson-Gimlin film is it, maybe it's been something else that's moved the ball down the field for you since 67? And where are you on maybe ideas for going out into the field? Is there maybe there's something you guys are even working on to maybe advance that and move the ball a little bit farther down the field as far as Bigfoot research is concerned? Yeah, I mean, in terms of video evidence, obviously it's scant. I mean, you've got alleged photographs, uh, but I think some of the thermal videos that are out there are, are intriguing. That's, I think, probably for me, some of the thing that uh, that are very kind of fascinating. You've got a couple of good examples. I mean, uh, thermals footage I think is interesting especially the the backstory behind that if you talk to the folks Robert Leiterman and Kip Morrill and others that were involved in uh, debunking that in a way that coming out with the conclusion of you know how how could this possibly have been a person you've got the squeaky thermal out of North Carolina you're probably familiar with that one uh, the Stacy Brown footage out of Florida which you know I know Stacy it's interesting I, he's a bit of a controversial guy I think but I uh, you know, I, I don't know. I still don't know where I sit on the footage, but it's it's pretty dang intriguing. And, you know, there's there's stuff like that that's out there that I think is is um, something to talk about. I like to focus a lot on thermal. I think thermal is definitely a way to go. And when it comes to drones, yeah, I've had this conversation time and time again. Um, I think you're right. It's an all of the above kind of factor. There are definitely boots on the ground people. And as a boots on the ground person myself, you know, I, I, I welcome it. I want we use drones. I mean, I have I don't know if you can see it on my shelf behind me, but I've got a couple of drones just right right here that I use um, that are, you know, DJI sort of consumer grade filmmaking drones. Don't have thermal capabilities, but we use them not only to get pretty shots of the scenery, but hey, if I want to go hike to this swamp, let me see what it looks like. Or let's see what the top of this mountain looks like. Just throw the drone up. It's so easy to do. Uh, as drones are getting smaller, more affordable, more attainable, I think they're going to proliferate. The issue you run into now actually is like in an area like Big Cypress National Preserve, where I just was at, which would be the absolute perfect place to run a thermal drone. It's, it's not allowed. It's, it's illegal. There's state parks, other places, state forests where it's illegal. Luckily, national forests, other than designated wilderness areas, you can still fly drones. So that's an area where, okay, you might, and I don't know how long that'll be. I mean, we may get that banned in the next few years. That's the issue with the drone thing. But I do think I've talked to Pat Turner about this. I know he's really big on that thing with the drone thermals. I know Matt Moneymaker recently has been getting into using thermals and the search and rescue applications. And you know, I've been looking at the DJI Mavic Enterprises, which come with equipped thermal uh, imaging and they're basically they market that towards search and rescue people where you the idea is you use a drone and a ground team to hopefully triangulate onto something i mean a forest galante who does a program on searching for extinct animals they've used thermal drones to locate big cats and other species that they're tracking at night essentially in the bush i don't see why we couldn't do this for sasquatch but cost pro being prohibitive is one thing i mean a really good thermal it's going to be at least five thousand, ten thousand dollars. I mean, the, the, on the low, low end of the good stuff, you're looking at least a few thousand. Uh, you know, I've used one that is, uh, I think it was one of these parrot ones. It was maybe a, a, a grand or two. Not that great. I mean, the limitations were as soon as somebody went into a thick Alaskan tree canopy, they were essentially gone. Um, so, you know, if maybe in a flatter area or somewhere more conducive, like Big Cypress, where you're just flat terrain with these pine trees that you can kind of peek in through. Um, 
you know, uh, out in Bluff Creek, a uh, guy named Damon Irons, he has a, one of these more higher grade drones and they got footage of a bear out there in, in, in Laird Meadow walking around this past summer with Tate Hieronymus and kind of the Bluff Creek guys. And, but, you know, not everyone's just going to be able to uh, get something like that. And sure, there is that ego aspect of the people saying, oh, well, you know, who needs the drones? We're boots on the ground. But there's so it, we were so limited. I mean, I get that feeling all the time in the woods where I'm out there. I'm frustrated. I say, OK, there's something literally right over there. But I mean, for me to even get over there, um, I just can't. I can't do it, especially at night. I, every I have every disadvantage. So having something like a drone Absolutely. I think going forward, I can't wait to uh, to get one of these, you know, higher grade thermal drones or as the prices fall. I mean, people make custom ones, um, all all sorts of stuff. So uh, we use them, like I said, in our normal daylight research. I mean, getting out there, not only getting those cinematic shots, but being able to scout an area. They work perfect for it. But you're dealing with limitations, legal stuff, you know, being able to use them in certain areas, that sort of thing. So. Uh, I don't think they're the end all be all, but I think they they have potential to be a tremendous asset to boots on the ground research. I don't think the idea that, you know, just using a thermal drone, you're going to be able to go around and locate it. I think having that sort of boots on the ground perspective and being in an area that's conducive might lead to something pr- pretty interesting. So maybe it's a matter of time until uh, we, we catch up with it. But um, I mean, there, there are other examples of wildlife being found with thermal drones, but uh, usually less elusive species. So um, I, I'm definitely on team drone for sure. I, I would love to, to, to get my hands on one of these things and get them out there. And like I said, we use the consumer grade ones. and They're fantastic for what they are. And obviously they're very limited at night and they don't have those capabilities. But uh, going forward, I get the feeling that it's going to be a lot more common, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, it was actually Pat that was on the show talking about the drone. So I told I Pat, <laughs> yeah, I told Pat, I said, start your GoFundMe, man. I will, I will put it out there for you. I will donate. We'll get you a thermal drone and you can tear North Georgia up and find Bigfoot because I know they're up there. We've Good. mentioned the more, the more people we have doing that, I think the absolute better. I mean, and just to, and not to interrupt you, but just to kind of go on a point that I like to hit on. I mean, we look at the data, right? This is one of the things that I do is I look at the data, you look at, okay, so many of these sightings are chance sightings where vast majority of the time, the person is not prepared. I mean, I've had times where I've had a, a 1200 pound moose run out in front of me. And by the time I have my phone or camera ready, it's already in the brush and gone. And this thing is six feet wide with the antlers, you know, so that's able to disappear. So most people get caught kind of with their pants down uh, or they're having something going on in their camp. You know, it's either from what I've seen, most sightings are either complete coincidence or something's coming in to check you out, or there's your rural property or uh, camp, whatever. I mean, the, the sightings seem to be somewhat in those two groups uh, for the most part. Um, and people don't aren't ready. I mean, just like I said, even seeing other wildlife and not being able to be ready in that moment. So our, our, my, a big philosophy of mine is, okay, I mean, we're out there so many times in areas that are possibly conducive, that have had sightings. What are the chances we might run into it and we're actually prepared? You know, this is a philosophy that my buddy Matt of Central Florida Bigfoot uh, does where he's always out there with cameras ready to go and uh, a stabilized zoom. So if he does see anything, there's going to be no more blurry iPhone photos of zooming in. I mean, being prepared, being in the right time at the right place, maybe we'll be able to get something more convincing. I think something like the Patterson-Gimlin film, but on a thermal drone, you know, where it's just or a thermal drone or a ther- just a handheld thermal that would be very convincing, you know, obviously going through an investigation and being able to sort of substantiate it would be fantastic. But I do think uh, that's something I really uh, personally with thermals, I think, that, especially at night, when we're so out of our element. I think that's a big one. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's just going to take a lot more of that sort of stuff. And if you look at how many people are actually looking, it's a drop in the bucket compared to how much space there is out there. I definitely agree. We've mentioned it a couple of times. Let's talk about Bigfoot beyond the trail. Let's talk about small town monsters. What are you working on? What do you got coming up? And what can we expect over the course of the 2023? Oh, man, <laughs> always working on something. So I, I, I'm currently literally just exporting. It says share successful. So we're good. Of a, a video from our recent Florida expedition where Tate Hieronymus and I were down there in uh, South Florida, which is a very fascinating area. You've got just under 3 million acres of protected land between Everglades National Park, uh, the Big Cypress Preserve, and a couple of other uh, state-run forests and parks. So that's an area that's almost three times the size of the whole state of Rhode Island. 
and then, you know, it's right outside of Miami, basically you go an hour outside of Miami or in the middle of nowhere. Um, so we went out there and did our kind of usual poking around. We, we were out in his Jeep. So we we're doing a little bit of a Jeep adventure. And what sucks is when you're in these areas for a limited amount of time, you got to try to figure out ways to possibly either get some kind of activity. And a lot of people criticize, oh, doing knocks or doing pheromone chips and that sort of thing. We've tried everything. When we'll try all kinds of different techniques, Himalayan singing bowls, playing Lego Star Wars on a projector screen in the middle of the Oregon wilderness just to see, hey, is anything interesting? You do something weird or unusual. Uh, bring, you know, playing the sounds of a baby fawn crying, just see if any predators want to come in. And, you know, we're sitting there in the Jeep with a thermal, pulsar thermal on a monopod and just scanning all directions as the baby fawn noises and see if a panther or anything wants to come out. So that's, a, that's an upcoming episode, uh, looking for the skunk ape. And then I will be going to Louisiana to do some stuff down there with uh, Scott of the Bigfoot Mapping Project. And um, we've got a lot in store for this year, uh, British Columbia, as well as returning to so-called Area A of the uh, the Alaska cabin on the Kenai Peninsula there, which was arguably you know, our, our biggest kind of adventure to date where we went out to this location and some of the audio and some of the stuff that's been captured out there in my view is, is pretty intriguing. I think it's a great location, very conducive for something like a Sasquatch. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of adventures. I mean, we've got 20 something independent episodes and those are all found on the small town monsters YouTube channel. Uh, and they're you know, these usually hour long documentaries uh, with our investigations and you'll see us out in the field. And I draw a lot of inspiration from stuff like survivor man with Les Stroud and kind of DIY sort of filmmaking. And it's part adventure series, part research. I mean, our goal is legitimately to treat the subject accurately and, and, and portray what we have experienced out there. I mean, unfortunately, we have a lot of hoaxing, a lot of TV shows that are out there that claim to be elite researchers or whatever, and, and just don't, don't have, you know, the interest of the subject at heart, I don't think, or, or tell the story accurately. We absolutely, if we have something happen, we'll tell you, and we're not going to sugarcoat it and say it was definitely a Bigfoot. We'll say, all right, this is what happened. Take it or leave it. You know, we will show you if we have nothing happen, you'll get to come along for a scenic ride in uh, some beautiful wilderness area across North America. And that's, that's sort of been the goal. And, and uh, another big goal of mine is as well to inspire people to really get out there. Uh, do your own research. Don't trust me. I'm just a guy talking in front of a camera on YouTube. Don't trust me. Please do your own research. But hey, if you see this and you learn something about an area you didn't know about, and that inspires you to want to get out there, especially in this day and age with the craziness of the world and technology encroaching, get out there, get enjoy the woods. I mean, I've had so many people that have messaged me and it really just makes my day where they're like, hey, I watched your, your documentary. It really, you know, I, I loved kind of being apart for the ride or people saying, oh, you know, I'm disabled. I'm not able to get out there, but I live vicariously through you guys. I mean, that, that means the world to me. So uh, inspiring younger people as well to really get a, 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 an interest in the outdoors, I think is fantastic. So um, yeah, we try to check off a lot of boxes with it, but we really try our best to just stay level-headed and uh, you know, we're not some elite researchers. We're just guys in the woods having fun. A lot of times it's goofy. You'll see the behind the scenes kind of chaos of being out in the woods for like a week at a time. It's, it can be tough. You know, you can, uh, you can really get on each other's nerves, but I think that's all part of the reality and you know, working in a team and that sort of thing. And ultimately trying to find some evidence that I think is interesting that we can then say, you know, we're not just doing it for YouTube, but if we find, if we get some interesting thermal or something, we can then pass that off to people that we trust or if we have a sighting or something like that i can I go to people you know, leon thompson others and kind of have them grill me about hey what you know i, I want you to debunk what i saw basically because i'm a bigfoot researcher i'm i want to be confident what i saw and that sort of thing so um, i think the the truth is really what we're uh, all about so um very open to talk about that and um yeah don't really have much to uh to say other than that, I suppose, but uh, we have a lot of fun doing it, and it's uh, it's a heck of a time out there. Are you guys going to be back up at the Smokies? I think when I talked to Seth, he said you know, you guys may be trying to come back this summer. So I think he is going to be going. I know the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference. I want to say Small Town Monsters is sponsoring the event. Don't quote me on that. Uh, we did last year, and uh, I got to I was a speaker at that conference, which was awesome. I got to meet so many great folks. Um, but uh, I think they will be going back out there. I don't think I will um, because I'm going to be in Alaska in June speaking at an event up there. And then we're going to be obviously out in the field. I mean, I don't do a whole lot of events every year, uh, maybe a few, but uh, 
when you're traveling a lot and get on the field, that's kind of more of my priority than just doing the kind of conference circuit. But there are some great events out there. We've done, we'll usually do a few a year, but we'll be up in Alaska in June. So maybe a little tough for me to get back home and then uh, have to hit the road again for Smoky Mountains. But I went out last year and I did a solo night out in the um, bridge to or tunnel to nowhere area on that uh, uh, Fontana Lake, I believe, side of the Smokies. Um, really cool area. It was just that humidity killed me. <laughs> I was soaking for 24 hours straight. Yeah, Tennessee in July is a sticky situation. Yeah. Well, Alex, I really appreciate you coming on, man. I've had a blast talking to you. Thanks for coming on and sharing your experiences and just what you guys do. I think it's great. Small Town Monsters. I've I've never seen anything that you guys done that I did not think was absolutely fabulous. So thanks for what you do and going out and bringing us out there with you and letting us share that experience, man. It's been a blast talking to you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on, man. I uh, really enjoy the program and Wish you best of luck with other guests. I know you've had a ton of awesome ones on. I'm sure you'll have some uh, some great shows upcoming as well. They say you don't gotta go home, but you can't stay here.